Welcome to the All About Audiology podcast, episode 16, another All About You episode, because one of the main reasons I'm doing this show is so you feel less alone, more educated, and empowered to be the very best advocate for yourself and your loved one wherever you are on this hearing journey. I'm Dr. Lilach Saperstein. The last episode, we talked all about sign language, and I interviewed Kimberly Sanzo. That episode was well-received by so many of you, and I really appreciate the comments on Instagram and on allaboutaudiology.com, where the post is, as well as full transcripts of each episode. And in next week's episode, we're going to be talking all about cochlear implants. And I'm going to explain how they work, a little bit about the process, and I'm also going to include an interview with a mother who has two children who are implanted and hearing more about her journey. First, I'm going to share with you some of the comments that came in about last week's sign language episode. And for today, I also wanted to bridge the two episodes together, sign language and cochlear implants, and really show that the either or doesn't have to be there. And so I invited my friend who really exemplifies this. Her name is Toby Coleman. She is an implant user. You'll hear all about her story. And she says that she has one foot in the hearing world, one foot in the deaf world. And so I hope you'll listen to last week's episode if you missed it, all about sign language, and that you'll stick around again for next week's episode all about cochlear implants, and that we can really learn from Toby about how in her life she's been able to integrate both of these parts into her identity and her life. And before we jump into that, I'll first share a couple of comments. Thank you to everyone who sent in comments and being part of the All About Audiology community. Alicia commented on Instagram, this episode was fantastic. It makes me so sad that no one from our medical team mentioned the option of ASL. In fact, we were discouraged from using it from our son. Thankfully, we did our own research and decided that learning ASL was the right choice for our family. It was so refreshing to hear this point of view discussed on a medical podcast. Thank you for being open and judgment-free. Alicia, thank you so much for your comment. This is the reason I do the podcast. It's because I saw so many parents in your position who wish that they had been better informed. Just to have been given the options and then being allowed to do your own research and coming to your own conclusions for what works for you and your family, like you said. I always believe knowledge is power. Now, Ariella commented on the blog and she wrote, I think it's crucial for Kimberly to think about how she uses shaming words like tiger mom. Not only is she furthering the divide between groups whose ultimate goal is a deaf child's well-being, but it is also that same tiger mom dedication that gives a person strength to fight for her child to have access to sign language and to go against the countless professionals who say not to. And so thank you, Ariella, for sending in this comment. I really appreciate that you're able to voice your opinion here. Whatever it is that you would like to say, you'll be heard around here. I think it's always tricky when we're passionate about an important issue and we're also at the same time trying to consider the connotation of the words that we use. So I appreciate you bringing this up, and I think that our use of the expression tiger mom was more of a way to express tenacity and passionate, go-getting, in no way trying to be shameful or be derogatory towards anybody's decisions, and I, I hope that that came through as well. I appreciate you bringing this up so we can all be more mindful and thoughtful of the words that we use. Thank you for listening and commenting, and as I always say, This goes for all of you listeners. If you think there's a point of view being left out or a piece of constructive criticism, then please reach out, share it with me, and we should all be learning from each other. Another topic that came up in the comments was how to access exposure to native sign language. If you are, you know, you're hearing parents, everyone you know is hearing, you've never met a deaf person before. And so if you're interested in exposing your child to native sign, where are you going to find native sign language users to help you with that? So there are some states that offer what's called a deaf mentor through early intervention. So try and see if that's offered in the state that you are or or in the country that you are. And unfortunately for the states or places where that's not offered, you can always reach out to the local community where you are. 
You can try contacting people at schools for the deaf in your state and they would have contacts within the community or of teachers who would be able to to do such a thing. I know that there are some mommy and me kind of programs in the deaf education school. So even if it's an elementary school, they might have an infant program or something like that. You can also look up deaf clubs in your area with all the Facebook groups and meetup groups and all these things. If you can do your research and try to get in contact with the right people, I'm sure that you would be find some people who, are, who would be willing to help. And another way you can find access to sign language tutors is by contacting sign language schools and interpreter training programs. So through those contacts, you might find interpreters or sign language teachers or hearing people who are also fluent in sign, and that might be appropriate for you. So thank you for the comment. I wish you good luck with finding the resources that you're looking for. So now on to our interview with a cochlear implant user who is also a fluent signer, who has her master's degree in special education, who is expecting her first child soon, my friend Toby Coleman. Welcome, Toby, to the All About Audiology podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, I love talking about myself. Let's see. (laughs) I am 27 years old. I'm married to my husband, Moshe Mordechai, and we are living in Baltimore right now. I'm a teacher at a special needs inclusive preschool, and it's a wonderful experience working with children, and I absolutely love it. Um, What else do you want to know? Oh! Very important. I have cochlear implants. Yeah, we wanted to get a sense of the whole journey for you and also what your thoughts are on the decisions that were made for you when you were a baby. How old were you when you were implanted? Okay, so my first one on my right side, I got implanted when I was three years old, um, 1994. And my left side, I got implanted in 2013. Can you tell us a little bit about your family? and what the decision was like for your parents and their connection to deaf culture and ASL. Okay, all right. Plus from the beginning. For a long rant. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So basically, um, in my family, there are six of us. I have four brothers and one sister. Myself and my sister are the ones that have cochlear implants. Um, My father's parents um, were also deaf. So, yes, there is um, deafness in the family. Um, we have um, Connects 26, I believe that's what it's called. So, my grandparents spoke in sign language to each other. So, therefore, my father knew sign language and he was very involved in an organization called Our Way, which is an outreach program for the deaf in the Jewish community. And um, he helps them getting services, meeting other Jewish staff, being together all over the United States and Canada and in Israel. Um, Yeah, he's been everywhere. I'm kind of jealous of him. I wish I can travel too. So your father, he's hearing? Yes, he is hearing. Yeah, so my father's a coda and my grandparents were deaf and they knew sign language. Um, and they spoke that was the language that was spoken in the house. My mother became a special ed teacher. She really knows firsthand about what goes on. So basically, after three of my brothers were born, they're all hearing. My sister was born. Life went on as normal. They didn't know that she was deaf until she was 18 months old. My mother realized that, hmm, something she's not responding, you know, and sure enough, she was deaf. They gave her hearing aids, and then eight years later, I mean, I have a brother, and then I came along. Sure enough, hearing test came on the screen, and I'm, I'm deaf. My parents want me to be able to use all the technology out there, all the resources out there to help me be part of the world, to have access to everything that everybody else is doing, you know. That's what we call the hearing people, you know. Um, I being involved in everything and not be so isolated or left out. So 
um, at that time, cochlear implant was fairly new. It was like 10 years old kind of thing, right? You know, people were still hesitant. They were not so sure. But my parents did a lot of research and they felt that it was important. They gave it to me when I was about four years old. Do I remember the surgery? No, I do not. I just remember that my head was heavy in a white bandage and that was it, you know? So I've been wearing my cochlear implant. And then a few years later, my sister, who was eight years older than me, she got it when she was 12. So I got advanced bionics cochlear implant in one year. And my sister got nucleus for one year. And we both got mainstreamed in regular schools. We had oral interpreters, which means they sat next to us in the classroom and they basically repeated what the teacher was saying or they were like, they're kind of like note takers slash repeating. And we had a tremendous amount of speech therapy. We had like at least five times a week. At that time, we had to go to the therapist's house or to the clinic. And my parents would drive like an hour each way, like just to get us therapy. They really, you know, they did so much for us. Um, and I am grateful for the effort that they put in Josh and it really paid off, you know, and then basically we got older and their philosophy is very much deafness is not an excuse. Just because you can't hear does not mean that you can't do anything. It's not an excuse. At the same time, it's a certain pride that was instilled in us. I don't know how they did it, but it worked. Um, there's a certain, like, be proud that you're deaf, that even though you can't hear, you can still accomplish, you can do it, you know, and conquer the world. They um, supported me all the way through. If I needed help, they got help for me, and they um, encouraged me, and they didn't let anything stop me. What communication mode was being used at home? If you got a only at age four and she was 12. So prior to that, you were using sign language at home, had your hearing brothers. So was it both? Okay. Very good. Very good. So basically, um, very interesting that you asked that question because remember I mentioned that my grandparents were deaf. So my grandmother, she never moved her mouth when she signed. Like she didn't have a, a voice, you know? So basically, I was starting to sign a little bit and a mixture of cue speech. You know, it's a little bit different than sign language, but it was like a experimental stage, you know, to see what can happen. So I looked at my grandmother and I saw that when she used her hands, she didn't talk. So I used my hands and I didn't talk. And the only way to get me to talk was to put your hand over my mouth. My parents saw that. They said, okay, no, 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 this has to stop. You know, so they stopped. Um, doing sign language and cue speech. And then I started talking like normally again. But then when I got older, I picked up sign language again, you know, from my father's organization and having deaf friends, you know, I started picking it up. The communication mode at home was basically talking. We all knew um, some level of sign language because of my father. He would, he would sign to us. Not all the time, but like, you know, it was like a second language in the house kind of thing. We talked to my grandmother in sign language, but the, the main mode was um, talking. Like if I say to my mother, wah, 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 Toby, go put on your cochlear implant, then we can talk. <laughs> you know? And um, that's how it was, basically. And my sister and I knew signing the most by my, all of my siblings. So we would sign to each other, you know, when our implants are off, and my father would also sign. And now I'm married, and my husband is hard of hearing, which means that he wears hearing aids. And we both, he also grew up orally, so we both talk and sign at the same time. So it's nice. That's wonderful. You mentioned that you were grateful for your parents for giving you all those therapies and really being dedicated to getting you oral and having access and everything. But was there ever a time that you resented it or you didn't want to do it anymore? 
or you just felt like they're pushing you too hard to to be oral when maybe you would have preferred to be left alone and use ASL as your mode and like felt that maybe the deaf identity was stronger. Right. So I've had my moments many times through life like that. First of all, I hated therapy. Mm. I wanted to go. Especially being in the car for so long. I didn't want to go. And like, no, no, I do not like therapy, but I was put up with it. It's only now that I appreciate it. You know, believe me, I was kicking and crying. Mm. Um, as for deaf identity, I did struggle with that a lot because I felt more comfortable with the deaf people. I felt like I had something in common with them. Like we both couldn't hear, so we used sign language. It's like so much more relaxed, you know? When I'm in the hearing world, like I have to like pay attention to everybody because I have a cochlear implant, so you have to focus more, you know? It's not like, okay, like, you know? And it's a little bit self-conscious when you can't hear somebody. It's a... It's like a, a, a little bit of a, like, oh, my gosh, I didn't hear what she said. And what if it's a question? What if it was an answer? I don't know. Uh, like, always on the on your shoulder, like, like, even though you may not notice it as much, you know, you're paying t- attention more, and it's more intense. Um, so um, there are points in my life where I'm just like, forget it. I don't want this anymore. Just leave me alone, you know. My parents understood me. They understood that it was frustrating at times, but you know, they, they really, um, they're like, you can do it. You can do it. I didn't really have that much of a choice. It wasn't like they're going to switch me to the deaf school, even though I asked once or twice, it wasn't going to happen, but, um, at least they heard me out. This is what I used to describe to them. I had like one foot in the hearing world. I had my hearing friends and I had the education of the hearing world, like, you know, the schools and the system and stuff like that. And then I had my other foot in the deaf world, which was socially, like, you know, um, I was much more outgoing and I was just like much more comfortable and it was so much more fun. It's like, it's like a hard balance, you know, or where do I belong, you know? It's called identity crisis and then you kind of, I guess you can say, I kind of like found my way and um, you go through this guided path and then you realize as you get older, it's your friends that are more important, you know, who your friends are and um, where does education um, more helpful. Uh, you take best of the both worlds and you combine it together. That's amazing. It's quite the journey. I think we can all relate to being teenagers having an identity crisis of one form or another and this is a really complex set of circumstances so now looking back what what advice would you give young people who are going through that or what would you tell parents whose children are going through that what's the best way because you know you, you seem to feel that your parents did an okay job which is pretty amazing <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Um, okay, so advice for like teenagers, like people going through these things, don't give up. I know, I know, I know, I know it's hard, but just like don't give up and like just focus on the friends that you have, you know, just focus on that and try to have a good time because at that point in life, that's what's really the most important thing. I don't think they're going to listen. <laughs> I wouldn't listen to anybody if I was a teenager, but yeah, um, it's hard. It's definitely hard. And what we go through is our challenge. And then the next person over who is hearing is going through a different challenge that they need to get through. And we don't have that challenge. We have a different challenge. And this is the challenge of our moment, you know, just got to get through it. That's my advice to that. As a parent, um, I would say it's really important to be able to communicate with your child, okay? Communicating means if your child is saying what, 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 what all day long to you and cannot understand you and you're repeating yourself 5,000 times, then obviously there's no communication there. You know what I mean? Find a way how to communicate with each other. If you try, you know, there's always trial and error all the time. you got to do it. you got to take the risk and trial and error, whether it's reading lips. If the child is still not being able to understand you 
by the second time like this, then you gotta switch to a different communication method. Go take courses. A yes, I'll go go to American Sign Language. Learn a few words. See how your child responds. If he gets it, then great. Please learn it. Learn it for your kid. You know, I know there's a stigma. All right. Oh my goodness, what is other people gonna think? So go sign in this store and that store. That's not no. But I I I'm strongly against it because that makes your child feel um very self conscious and like self and their self esteem is gonna um it's gonna it's gonna be hard hard to encourage the child to want to do be to be successful in life. Um, it's really important. I mean, I, I can't say it over and over again. It's so important that I understand you have, a, you have a baby and the baby is diagnosed being deaf and you don't know what to do. After a bunch of steps, I mean, when the child starts six months or a year, two years, when you see that you guys are not bonding well enough or like there's something lacking and the child is not paying attention or is frustrated, Find a different way, whether it's cue speech, whether it's um, or making sure you're facing each other, whether it's American Sign Language. I mean, find something. Make up your own sign language in the house so that you can communicate with each other. It frustrates me so much that there's this deaf child in the home with a family and he's just left out. Or the parent says, okay, go to bed, take a bath, shower, eat your dinner. There's no bonding time like oh how was your day today oh you got into a fight with so-and-so let's go like you know you're absolutely right that's that's for sure such a difficult challenge for a family that's not able to communicate with their child so are you speaking to the idea of some some people who they went they did the implant they're doing auditory verbal therapy six times a week and they're just not willing to to budge from that perspective that's yes. what you're talking about yes it's from that perspective yes that well the cochlear implant is supposed to do the magic trick like hello cochlear implant is a fantastic technology you can talk on the phone i mean it varies in different patients you know that have cochlear implants but for the most part people can talk on the phone people can work they can do all different kinds of things be, be integrated into the hearing world you know what, we're struggling also, and you want to be able to talk to your family without that struggle, yeah. you know? Yeah, I like the way, you know, you described earlier the effortless way, that it's just so much easier, it's relaxed, do not have to force and strain. You, so with the implant, would you say that you're tired more, things like that? Like, what's the experience throughout the day? Yes, so I put it on in the morning when I go to work, and then when I come home, my implant goes off. Like I, I need it off. I don't get a headache. It's just more like, uh, like when I take off my implant, it's like ah, uh, like okay, it's quiet time. It's like you know, you go to a wedding and there's band is playing so loud, and then you walk outside, you're like ah. Uh. So like when you're at that wedding, you're straining to hear the person next to you. No, I can't hear you. Right? This is so loud. You know, your brain is processing twice than a hearing person's brain is processing because you read the person's lip and then you heard the person and then you have to like, okay, so this is what the person is saying. So now I need to respond. It's like, a, it's like, like an extra step there. You know, I think most of us are pretty quick about it. It's just, it's, it's there, even though it takes a second, you know, it's, and it's, it's draining. Um, what I describe to people about how we can hear through our cochlear implants, it's like listening to a radio. It's like you hear the person talking on the radio, but it's not the same as hearing them in person. So it's like this mechanical thing, right, that if you hear it differently, but you still hear the person. But then you can't make that person louder and the background softer because the radio is on one setting. So you might have to like strain a little bit just to hear the radio clearly like what the person is saying as opposed to seeing the person straight up front in the face. Wow, that's a good example. That's very, that helps to think about it. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about having one implant growing up pretty much and then getting a second in your 20s? Right. 
Okay, so basically, um, this is the part where I get very opinionated. So you're going to have to um, bear with me. You're <laughs> more than welcome to disagree. Okay, so I was always hearing from one ear because um, I have one cochlear implant. And then I started working and I realized that I wasn't hearing everything. And it was getting emotionally draining. I did not wear my hearing aid in this year. I did not. So my audiologist said, I'm sorry, Toby, I, I can't make you any more maps because I'm hearing very well, you know. So she suggested that I should get a second implant and um, it would balance it out. Warning, when you get a cochlear implant, you lose the hearing that you previously had. Even if it's this much that you can't even see the gap, it's there and it's crucial. That's what I got to tell you. When you get a cochlear implant, it destroys it completely. I did not realize that. I didn't even know that I had hearing in this year before I had the surgery. I didn't realize. I thought it was like a sixth sense that a deaf person had. Well, news flash and it ain't the sixth sense. It's the little tiny drop of hearing that was left in there that I heard, but I felt that I heard it, but I didn't realize that I had it. And it was devastating when I had the surgery and for the second year, and I could not feel the person behind me, like, like walking up behind me. I didn't, I, I couldn't, like, you know, I didn't realize that there was, a, I mean, this is without my cochlear implants I'm talking about. Or mm -hmm. like a bus that was zooming by, I used to be able to know that there was a bus behind me. I thought it was the sixth sense. It was not. It was that loud motor that somehow got through my brain. That little bit of hearing was processing in my head that there's a bus behind me because it was so loud that it actually I actually heard it. It wasn't a sixth sense that I always assumed that I had, you know. With the second surgery, because I did not wear my hearing aids all of these years, it was not so successful. Um, it's used for environmental sounds. Basically saying that there's somebody over here that probably wants my intention and that I should turn my head. That's pretty much what it's for. So, yeah. Do you use both of them now? Um, no, I do not. First of all, I got it when I was older, and I felt like I just didn't have time in my life to be busy with my cochlear implants and practice with my speech and stuff like that. No. And I was expecting it to be like this, like with my first one. And it wasn't, and I wasn't prepared for that, I guess you can say. And um, I was just very disappointed. I mean, my audiologist now is telling me that now that the years went by and there's enough clients, they able to tell the difference between people that use their hearing aids, people that don't, and the age and this and that. Now they have more answers, and that was the answer that I got recently. So I'm, I'm satisfied with that answer. So if I wear it again, I'm going to know it's for en environmental sound, and then I'm not going to get my speech recognition. From this wow. Yeah. Hey, you're amazing. Thanks so much for being so open and talking about all this with, with me and with our audience. Hello, everybody. Yes, yes. No problem. <laughs> oh, wait. Can I add one more really opinionated um, thing? Of course. That's why you're here. I'm, I'm just going to say it as a deaf parent. All right. I mean, just to give another perspective, if I'm hearing the deaf, I guess you could say, I don't have children yet. So I, one is on the way. But um, it gets me nervous when babies get their cochlear implants when they're really, really young. We're talking about like six months and a year old, right? They do it really fast. And I'm like, whoa, the baby's head, you know? Um, I mean, me as a deaf person, a deaf person with a cochlear implant, I got it when I was four years old, okay? I don't know if it's really necessary that you have to rush it to six months. I mean, don't you want to enjoy your baby with the way they are until like maybe like a year, you know, and then give a cochlear implant because what you want to start running around for speech therapy and cochlear implants and stuff like that. I would encourage very much just like, okay, maybe hearing aids just put on and off and then like do baby sign language, you know, with them 
And it's so cute. You just give you a little hint, and then they respond back. There's so much communication going on there, and you're not even busy with cochlear implants. Oh, wait, can it hear? Can it not hear? I don't know. I have to go back to the audiologist. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, all these wires of the battery dead. I don't know. And then you start crying. Girl, just, just relax. Enjoy your baby for the first year if you can. My opinions are very opinionated, so you can ignore me if you want to. But like, and do baby sign language. It doesn't have to be professional sign language. This every yell want some soup. I love you. <gasps> Butterfly. And more milk. Yeah. You know? And they respond back even back even faster. I think what you're, what you're saying is that you want people to not rush and think, okay, we have to do this one option. We have to do it as fast as possible and just to take like a minute to enjoy their kid. But I think the, the urgency where that comes from a lot of times is because the surgeon or audiologist will tell them that, you know, the sooner you get it in, the more time their brain will have to learn it. And the younger they are, the better. And there's research to back that up. But I can definitely appreciate your advice to give it, you know, not to rush like for tomorrow when they're born. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm going against everyone here, but yeah. It's always best to follow doctor's advice, though. So can't argue with that. Yeah. The difference between an extra six months or an extra year, like getting implanted at a year or getting implanted at 18 months or getting implanted at 24 months, those differences are you know, a little bit this way, a little bit that way. Have you and your husband talked at all about um, your kids and what, you know, what expectations you have? Yes. So we have spoken about it. First of all, we don't know what we're having, you know, if we're going to have hearing children, deaf children. We don't know. Um, it's all in God's hands. So we've spoken about it. Basically, we want to make sure that we can get communication across. That's our main goal, you know, be able to talk about our day, understand our children and work with them to be there for them. You know, we want to sign to them in the home. And depending on the child, if the child is not so comfortable with their parents signing outside of the home, we will definitely respect that. We're trying to figure it out because one parent should have the voice off when they're doing sign language. I mean, that's for like, professional like you know fluent so we're having a hard time because we both talk you know we both talk and sign at the same time so when the time comes um it might have to happen where one of the voices will have to be off while the other one talks and uh my husband is thinking about having his voice off he's thinking about it we'll, we'll, we'll try our best you know and then um that way the child will talk my husband in sign language and talk to me and have a both languages and we can both understand the child you know that's from my communication perspective from the child perspective if, if it's hearing great if it's deaf um about getting cochlear implants and hearing aids and stuff like that like i said i was very opinionated before i would wait a little bit um maybe like a year just uh, be able to enjoy the moment, you know, and not run after speech therapy and like whatever, all these craziness about cochlear implants. Um, and then I would possibly think about cochlear implants because my husband is more, is more involved in the deaf culture as more than I am. So we might have to figure it out, our differences there. But in my personal opinion, I think that the child should get a cochlear implant. Um, I think cochlear implants are crucial. I mean, depending on how much hearing you have, of course, you know, if you have much more hearing than deafness, like whatever it is, percent of hearing, well, talk to the audiologist. Would you say that you're more comfortable in general with deaf friends or community members or with hearing people in general? Okay, good question. When I was younger, I was more comfortable with my deaf friends and community. I was much more comfortable now, like as an adult. I'm more comfortable with the hearing people, but and I enjoy being with my deaf friends and being part of the community. Um, it's just that there's a specific group of the deaf culture, which is called like the big D. 
um, which I stay away from because I, um, I don't agree with their philosophies and stuff like that. And they can tend to get angry. So um, I, I just don't, we don't talk about it, you know? We're very, like, we don't talk about it. We're, we're friends kind of thing. And some things we just avoid because we have different opinions about it. What's the crux of the disagreement? The fact that you have an implant? Well, I'm very lucky. For some reason, the deaf of the Big D community, I'm talking about like my group of friends, not the whole Big D. They accepted me even though I had my cochlear, I had my cochlear implant. Um, I guess it's because I knew my sign language and like I talked to them like normal people. I didn't look down on them. I didn't say like, oh, I know more than you or like I can hear better than you. Like I don't talk on the phone in front of them because I know that they can't hear. So I'm not going to do that. You know, I, I try to be respectful of them. You know, the point uh, where we get into disagreement is about sometimes you talk about like the deaf education or deaf awareness. I tell them in order to bring more deaf awareness, you need to teach hearing people and educate them what the deaf culture is about. If you're going to turn up your noses to the hearing world and be mad at them for being hearing, that's not going to help you. And they, they say like, well, no, they should know. They should already know before they come in to talk to us. I'm like, the way to get them is that you have to bring them in. Show them your culture. Show them, teach them sign language. Teach them, then they would be able to help us, you know? But we don't need help from the hearing people. Hello, we need interpreters. Interpreters got to be hearing. <laughs> that's, not, that's, um, that's where we get this little, like, they, they live in a bubble. Like, you know, the whole world should be deaf. Like, they have this deaf pride in them, which is amazing. But you got to share your pride a little bit and like, you know, um, spread it to others, inspire the hearing world and make them feel welcome. That's where really it all nails down to, you know, that the workplace, well, everybody should understand me. You know, I don't have to go around making myself understood. I'm like, hi, I have a cochlear implant and I didn't have to go around to make sure I get myself understood because if I answer the wrong question or if I say something different, it ain't, ain't going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's great, and thank you for asking me to be interviewed. You're awesome. Wow, thank you so much to Toby again. What a fabulous conversation, and getting a, an inside look at her experience and the way that she's been able to integrate being part of the hearing world, being deaf and using the cochlear implant and succeeding in the hearing workplace. I'm really grateful that she was open and, and was able to share her experiences with us. So I just have a couple of notes on some of the things we mentioned um, throughout our conversation. When she got the implant, that was over 20 years ago, and many changes have come since then. There are new implants that actually do preserve some of the hearing if there is hearing remaining um, and there's different outcomes so everyone has a different outcome that's unique to them there are so many factors that are going to affect how somebody does with the with the cochlear implant how old they were when they got it and their general cognitive ability and how committed they are to uh, mapping appointments and do they attend all the therapy sessions are they able to have access to the therapy so there's so many different factors that go into someone's quote-unquote success with the cochlear implant to be able to use it for, for speech perception and speech understanding everyone's outcomes are going to be unique and there is no way to know prior to getting it and prior to going into the whole journey to know what the future is going to hold. There are some factors that we know are predictive of success, but, but we can never know. And also the age when a baby can get implanted also has changed over the years. It used to be that children were much older when they even were identified as being deaf. So two, three years old when they weren't speaking. And now, thanks to the newborn hearing screening, we're doing identifications much, much earlier and getting children hearing aids very soon and being able to do candidacy evaluations much earlier in life. And 
I believe that the current recommendation is that around the 10 to 12 month window is an ideal time because the baby is old enough for a stable surgery and it's also early enough to maximize that neuroplasticity that we have during infancy. So definitely join us next week for the All About Cochlear Implants episode. There are a lot of myths and misconceptions about cochlear implants, and we're going to talk about a lot of them and talk about the process and how they work and all of that, in addition to hearing from some of your experiences. So as always, send in your comments or any questions you have on the upcoming topic. You can always reach me at All About Audiology Podcast on Instagram, on Facebook, and at allaboutaudiology.com. I'm Dr. Lilach Saperstein, and this is the All About Audiology Podcast.